I called you a wig earlier. Um, and I would say you come to your principles first and therefore you say, okay, this is the party for me. And um, there are other people who say this is the party for me and therefore these are going to be my principles depending on where the party goes. And that's what we've seen a lot of with, with Trump. Right now we're seeing a lot of that with Biden. But one of the things that I think that gets lost among conservatives in America is that the point of the conservative movement was not to make the Republican Party more conservative. The point of the, Republic, the conservative movement was to move the center of gravity in a more, of America in a more conservative direction. And the problem is, is that I think a lot of people, including some of my closest friends who I respect dearly, they've so internalized the idea that what is good for Republicans is good for conservatism and what is good for conservatism is good for Republicans, that sometimes they cannot see progress that has a different partisan valence to it. And so I would argue that you can make a case that the election of Keir Starmer, for all the problems that will come with it, for all the problems of having labor in charge, and there will be many, um, is at least in some respects a victory for conservatism because Starmer famously moved his party away from Corbynism, away from the sort of jackassery of the hard left 15, 10, 10 15 years ago, and realized sort of like Bill Clinton, whatever is in Starmer's actual heart, I, I don't know. But to get elected, you had to be more moderate, you had to move towards the center or appear to move towards the center. And that is a sign of success for conservatives, maybe not the conservative party, but for conservatives in the sense that they've moved the center of gravity about where you actually win elections away from sort of Corbinite nonsense and, and perfidy and villainy towards, you know, social democracy stuff that I disagree with, but is but I could live with compared to what, you know, what a, a Corbin type would want. What do you think of that? I, I think that's typically interesting um, and, and thought provoking uh, as you always, I mean, first of all, on, on the, on the first point, I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, it is striking that this wider conservative movement, this penumbra around the party is much stronger in the U S than in any other country, even Canada. Uh, Americans are much more likely to join lobby groups, pressure groups, campaigns, or indeed anything else. They're, they're a very joiny people compared e even to the, the countries that are culturally closer to them. So, so the, the, the Republican Party in the Bush years had the advantage of nestling within this wider family of you know, talk show hosts and gun clubs and homeschool movements and evangelical churches and all sorts of people who were moving the center of gravity. There, is, there isn't anything like that in the UK. And that's a, a, a significant difference. Um, but in terms of, is this, a, is this a victory for the right? I mean, certainly the election of Tony Blair was in that sense, right? After mm -hmm. he, that was a moment when the left had to accept the basic propositions of the market in order to get elected. Starmer is a more interesting one. The, the far left here are making hay out of the fact that he got fewer votes than Corbyn did. You know, and they're saying this, is, you know, mm -hmm. this shows that we've just fluked this one. It was just because of the divided right. There's no enthusiasm. We're going to lose it next time. All this. Um, what's going on in his inner heart? Who knows? Right. He was he was a he's very good at saying what people want to hear at that moment. So he was. Most of his career, he was a man of the firm left. When he was climbing the ladder in Labour, he, he was always attacking from the left. Uh, it's not, everyone remarks that he backed Corbyn as prime minister twice. I, I give him a pass on that because I just I, I think if you if that really bothers you, you don't really understand how how party politics works. That's kind of a that's a, a minimum entry requirement. But I give him less of a pass for the fact that as late as March 2020, when he became leader, he was still talking about. Corbyn's manifesto is the centerpiece of what we believe. So his conversion has been a very recent one, uh, you know, even even by mm -hmm. the standards of politicians. Um, but I, I, honestly, you know, I, I think if we're going to if we're going to look at a, a really valid parallel here. I think the problem. is comparable to what happened in the 70s, immediately before Margaret Thatcher took over. The problem that the conservatives have is that a lot of voters think that 
if the government isn't spending more money on their particular issue, it's out of meanness. It's out of sheer lack mm -hmm. of generosity. It's not because the money is limited. Somehow it could all easily be got from the rich or from oil companies or something. And, and there is a, there, you know, austerity is a sadistic political choice. It's not, it's not like a family budget that has to remain within bounds. Now, the only way I think that people are going to be jogged out of that illusion is when they see a Labour government running out of money, which I think is very likely to happen during this term, because we are still, I mean, we're, we're three years on from the lockdown. Uh, the, the financial crisis is a distant memory, and we are still running a massive deficit with absolutely no plan to bring spending back to where it was in February of 2020 before the, the lockdowns, right? So I, I, this is what I mean by a parallel with the 70s. There was a, a Tory government that spent too much, followed by a Labour government that then ran out of money. And that mm -hmm. created the political scenario where Thatcherism was possible because people understood then that this was about having to live within our means. Now, some countries in Europe have done that more recently because of the Euro crisis. Ireland and Greece are two outstanding examples of countries that just, in order to meet payroll, had to cut spending and did and have now both done extremely well since. I think something similar is likely to happen. It, it may even be, and this really would be, the ultimate victory uh, for the wider conservative movement. Sorry to answer your question in such a long-winded way. It may even be that, that that process of restoring order and sanity to our public finances has to begin under a Labour government because their hand is forced by international events. So we, we tend to think in this country, because particularly people of my age who grew up under, under Thatcher, we, because we have that experience in the 80s, we tend to think that the reform comes from a successful, radical, uh, free market conservative government that is prepared to take on all comers and, and do brave things. Actually, if we look at other Anglosphere countries, very often the reform begins on the left. Uh, Roger Douglas in New Zealand, Paul Martin in Canada, arguably even Bill Clinton in some ways in the, in the US in terms of welfare reform and so on. So... Uh, it, it is not impossible. I wouldn't rule out the possibility. He, he doesn't want to do this. He'll he'll be dragged there kicking and screaming. But if the bond markets turn on the Labour government, if the penny finally drops that Britain is not bringing its spending down and isn't isn't doing anything to increase growth, it is possible that welfare reform, reform of our useless healthcare system, will have to start under these guys. Yeah, I mean uh, the better example in America than Clinton, although Clinton is a good example, I I would argue. Um, is uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, yeah. Not a huge fan of Jimmy Carter. I mean, I, God bless. He's, I've never heard of someone being in hospice this long, so, you know. But uh, a lot of the deregulatory stuff that we love to tout as Reaganism kind of starts under Jimmy Carter. And, and of course, Reagan then turns it to 11 in all sorts of ways and all praise and honor upon on the Gipper. But, um, uh, I think you're right. You often see these things that out of necessity is forced upon the party that doesn't want to do it. And that gives it a legitimacy that then the, uh, the party that does want to do it can run with. Um, right. It opens the door. It it opens the a... door and that makes all the difference. It right. allows the other guy then to say, look, this isn't scary. Exactly that. Which is why in some ways I feel, you know, I, I'm getting so exhausted hearing about how, and I understand that part of the reason why people are saying it is to butter Joe Biden up to get him off, off the stage. But I const I'm constantly hearing how he had the most successful presidency, first term presidency of any American president in modern memory and all this kind of stuff. And my wife and I are constantly looking around saying, what, what are you talking about? But um, that said, I think his one of the great wastes of his presidency is that he was elected with his mandate to be normal and do and put America back on a normal path. And instead he got, um, you know, he got buffeted by the hard left and did all sorts of things that I think set him up for the precarious situation that he's in now. Um, 